Krista, thank you so much for joining us here on the Build Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. So you recently told me that founders need to always be asking themselves the question, do I have the team for the future? So what does that mean and why is that such an important question for founders to be constantly asking themselves? Yeah, I think, you know, if I think back to my early career and my days and particularly at Salesforce, Salesforce is a company that is really cognizant of kind of moving through leadership and moving people into different roles to challenge them professionally, but also just to provide kind of a different level of insight into the business that it may or may not have had before. And at Salesforce, we always joked like, okay, I've had, you know, six bosses in six years and that was kind of funny. And and it is a little inconvenient, right? And I am not recommending that anybody has six different bosses in six years. But what I really learned through that was that we were phenomenal in my time there. And I'm guessing they still are. But in my time there of really assessing the leadership team in a high growth company and really understanding Like, does this team have what it takes or do these individuals have what it takes to make it to the next level? And most high growth companies always, while they may not have a formal three-year plan, they certainly have an idea of what their revenue is going to look like in three years or what they want it to look like in three years. Operationally, how to get there, whatnot, who knows? But when I I say, like, do I have the right team for the future, think thinking about that team in three years and even five years, because three years, particularly from an executive perspective, is not a long time to have somebody at your company. Um, And in many cases, like they're just getting started with their real value after three years, you know? So, So taking a look at that three to five year horizon and saying, do I believe this person can really take me there? And, you know, a lot of tech companies think about this at these 50 million milestones, 100 million milestones, 250 million in revenue. And a lot of companies are at that 50. And if you think about the profile of it takes, and and you think about sales, right? Or really, I think this is uh, pertinent in any function, but sales is an easy example. If you think about the profile of a sales leader that can get a company from zero to 10 million or zero to 50 million, and then you think about the the profile of someone to get you to 250, they're often, sometimes they can make the leap, but it's often two very different people because from zero to 10 or zero to 50, you're scrappy. You're in it. You're selling. Like you're doing the work and leading a small team. Whereas at 250, you're leading a team and you're really figuring out like what are the scalable, repeatable things so that we can do this more efficient, faster, bigger deals, you know, faster closes, that kind of thing. And, and, And that doesn't always come naturally. Like that particular skill set that I just talked about is often you've done it before. Yeah, the what's coming through to me on that is um, one of my favorite startup sayings is um, in a lot of times people will sort of make it as a juxtaposition of like first time founders versus second time founders. Um, And so through that lens, people often say first time founders focus on the what uh, almost exclusively uh, or at least first. And then second time founders or experienced founders, people who know what they're doing, they'll focus on the who first before the what, uh, or at least the who and the what as equal importance. Uh, And so that's kind of the, here's our strategy, that's the what, but then there's got to be a team that delivers on that strategy. So that's the who. Um, And so I think there's a really helpful framework to think through, but um, you're getting at some of the common uh, traps that people fall into when they're um, either thinking about that question or not thinking about that question. One of them is, you know, well, look at all the great stuff this person has done up till now. They've been such a great performer. And you start to like mentally extrapolate that they'll just continue to perform on that same level, but the organization changes. It gets way more complex. And so I guess in addition to that, um, there's the, you know, the, the backward looking view and they've done so much. They've been so great up to this point. What other common traps do people fall into? Is it, I imagine a loyalty thing comes in there, but what else do you see that causes people to be blind to this in the first place? I mean, I think, so I've been, I, I transitioned to board and advisory work two and a half years ago. And I'll say this as the disclaimer, it is so much easier to see the forest through the t- trees when you're not involved in the day-to-day work of building a business. Like it just is. Um, and, and the thing that I have noticed over the last two and a half years is when I'm talking to these companies and thinking about, you know, do I want to enter, do I want to help them? Do I want to join their board? Whatever. 
it's really clear to me the who, like, do you have the right team? And the companies that are going to be successful, it is the who. So I want to underscore the importance of where you started with your question. I mean, the what, yeah, you have to have product market fit. There has to be real pain. You have to build the product. Like all those things, yes, are very critically important. But once you get that, the who has outsized importance because you have to make sure that you have the right team that can get you to that 250. And the biggest, so, and I won't even say they're mistakes because I think they're human. Like I, I get it. It's not like, oh, you were making a mistake. They're very human things to do. If you think about it, you, you started this company, you selected this group of people that were incredibly capable to do the, usually it's the, the, what are we doing right in that first stage. And that is really hard work. Like it's hard, hard work. You are in it, you know, how many ever hours a day and you guys are together and you usually have crappy office space or maybe now with COVID you're all working remotely so it's a little better, but like it is, it's, it's a bonding experience. You were incredibly bonded, incredibly close with those people and you built this thing and it's pretty cool. And now you're getting traction and you're seeing this result and you're celebrating together and it's starting to become, it's still hard work, but the, the scale from hard work, like just the grind to fun is starting to shift a little bit because, wow, this is fun. Like we're having some success. And if you apply that to any relationship that you have in your life outside of work, like, yeah, I want to party with that person. Like I want to enjoy it. I want to have a good time. And so you are, it's, I mean, you said it, it's loyalty is one way to put it, but it is this incredible, really unique bond. And it's exceptionally hard for anyone to look at that bond and say, this is still really functional. Like this is working. We work well together. Everything's going fine, but you are not the person who can get me to 250. And human nature, what human nature will do is, and, and this is goodness again, like this is good. We want those people to get to 250 million. We believe that they can make it because they did it with us. And so the question, like, that's just hard. That's hard. That's like, you know, getting out of a really good relationship, or I can't think of the right comparison, but it seems almost um, in many ways in the context of relationships, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense. But in this, it does, because if you think about that really good spot that your relationship is in, but then somebody in that, let's, you know, pod stops performing in the same way. And so when you think about that scale of work to fun, that starts going back the other way because that person isn't delivering what you need them to. And so then that once phenomenal relationship starts to erode and that you that thing that you built and that thing that you did together is a little bit, um, I guess, like stained for lack of a better term or, you know, it's not the same because you let it go too far. And I think that's a really personal way to appeal to founders to think about this. Like you want to end on a high note. We did this awesome thing. It's never going to be easy to let somebody go or to move on, but um, that's the biggest thing that I see is like this bond and this loyalty and this relationship. That's the biggest obstacle people have. Yeah, there there is a key distinction between person and role, uh, yeah. and a lot of times that's the same thing in everybody's mind. Um, but just di di uh, sort of disaggregating those two and breaking those two apart and say, I can love this person more than anything in the world. And I could love them and all of the things they've brought to our team and all the things they've done. But let me talk about this role and the role that we're gonna need for the next you know, phase of growth, whatever it is. Is that person the right fit for that role? Uh, and you can be a little bit more objective and dispassionate about it. You can still be human. You could still be kind in the way that you deliver that feedback. But having this juxtaposition of person versus role um, is an unlock to me um, and, and super um, helpful. And it really kind of helps you realize that what you're solving for is not building a group of, you're not building your own personal social network of people you want to spend time with. Uh, you're building a puzzle. Uh, and so there's a puzzle piece, um, you know, there's a hole in the puzzle and you need the right piece for it. And is this human that I love and I respect and is great, but are they the right puzzle piece? Does it fit or does it not? You know, there's kind of one answer. And, and so that can maybe, you know, help unlock for, for some folks. It's one way that I look at it. Um, one thing, I guess, getting into some of the specifics here, um, you know, on what founders uh, experience and what founders the day-to-day -day looks like. A lot of times founders, or, or almost all the time, founders have 
one core strength uh, or one core superpower, and that comes from their background. Uh, if you're an engineer, if you're a product uh, person, then you're gonna have a background that's more product oriented, more technically oriented. You're gonna be really good at assessing role, uh, really good at assessing the future. What do we need? Are we gonna be able to continue to scale? Um, and then on the other side, you might have somebody who has a superpower around go to market, around sales, because that's what their background is. And so wh whatever side of the house you land on, almost every founder lands on one side of the house or the other. There's very few who are truly excellent at both. So that means you're gonna have a natural strength but also a natural blind spot. And so for folks that are listening right now that are in that position, I'm that product engineering founder or I'm that go-to-market founder, I have a blind spot on the other side. How do you address that uh, in this context of evaluating, you know, do you have the team for the future? Yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, I see it all the time. And in the best CEOs, what I see them doing is being really honest and saying, I, I don't know anything about go to market or I don't know anything about product engineering. Um, I can interview somebody and kind of see if they'll be a good fit for the team and if they understand our space, that kind of thing. But um, the easiest way, and you don't see a lot of CEOs doing it, which is really interesting to me. I don't know why. I think, I don't know if it's that there's this idea of like these people have to have a formal relationship with me or they have to be on my board. Um, but surround yourself with people who have the opposite skill. So if you're the, uh, founder who's got kind of the engineering product stuff nailed surround, when you think about your board, obviously you're going to have your investors, but you're going to have your independence. You're going to have some advisors that are surrounding you. Think about those people. Who do I want to bring in who can really work with me in a one-on-one -on -one basis? Maybe you're not ready for an independent on your board or you don't have space right now, but who do I need to work with me to help me understand what great looks like at $250 million in a sales leader? What great looks like at $500 million, a billion? And do they have the network? Are they willing to bring me into their network, not only from a recruiting perspective, but from a coaching perspective? Like, can I get these people in, in addition to this individual, but will they share their people with me? And there are so many people out there who will do that. They're like, I mean, people love talking about their experiences and, you know, what's worked and what's not. And obviously you have to make sure that you're choosing well, um, and that you're choosing the right people from really successful companies and it takes some work networking to get there. But anybody who's venture backed, most venture companies have these relationships. And so you just have to ask. Yeah. And, you know, the idea of, well, well, first off, um, lean on others um, where your superpower does not lie. So where you have a blind spot, find others who don't have that blind spot. Um, your blind spot is their superpower uh, and lean on them. That makes all the sense in the world, especially if they're experienced and they've done it um, you know, multiple times or done it very successfully. They're going to have really great pattern recognition, really great rules of thumb that you can learn from so that you develop that pattern recognition or those, you know, rubrics or whatever it is, but also so you can outsource and kind of lean on their brain. And so this idea of leaning on others is, is great. Um, but this idea of also bringing the who versus what lens to your advisors or to your board members or to these external experts is incredibly important because, again, you could have a product and or engineering oriented uh, backgrounded founder who says, all right, well, I need some help on go to market. So then I just go and ask a bunch of go to market strategy questions. Um, should I think about MQLs or SQLs? And like, that's the what. And again, if you don't know that stuff, like important to get the context. But um, in addition to that, bringing this who lens of, yeah, I want to ask you some strategy questions. And yeah, I want to know, uh, make sure that I brush up on my chops on go to market because I'm not strong there. But more important than that, I want to get your take on team, both like, hey, could you interview my current team? Could you give yeah. me your view of them? And then per your point of what is good look like, what does that future role look like? What should I be solving for that I'm not currently thinking about today? And like really leaning on those outside experts for the who, not just the what is yeah. huge. Yeah, 100%. And I think in that scenario, you do, uh, if you're having, you know, somebody come in and get involved in your team, it, it's sometimes just easier to have them in an advisory aspect, but that's really easy to do. And it's not usually a cash scenario if you're worried about those types of things. Um, getting those people involved and just saying like, hey, will you, I just want you to meet with my go-to-market leader or leaders and I want you just to kind of have the conversation. And the conversation that I usually have is super casual. Like I don't ask them to prepare anything for the call because I don't want to freak them out. I don't want them to feel like they're being graded. Um, 
I will say like just, you know, the standard and really generic, what are your, what are you super excited about and what are your challenges? And I ask, you know, I usually have some context from others around what are the growth rates look like? And certainly some leading questions from if, if there are concerns and many times there are concerns with the CEOs or the founders of these companies. Um, but those concerns will come up in my conversations when I ask questions like, okay, well, um, what metrics are most important to you? And I hear new revenue. Well, that's not a real sales leader if you're only concerned about new revenue, right? Or, or when I ask a question of what does your um, quarterly revenue look like? What's the mix of install base expansion versus new revenue? And it's really skewed in one way or the other for a really early stage company. To me, I'm like, mm, okay, tell me a little bit more about that. And if it's a non-issue, I'm like, okay. So we have a business leader who is not, when they are at 100 million or 250 million, they're not going to be able to think about those two books of business because they will be similar size and how you manage them, how you prioritize them, that kind of thing. So that's one example of a question, just really simple questions. But if you're a CEO and you have no idea about what, you're not, you're not going to, you might know to answer, to ask that question, but you're not always really going to know what the good answer is because it's very nuanced and there's a lot of data and information and vocabulary and that you may or may not be familiar with. So when you're in those contexts and you're interviewing a team and you're getting answers like that um, to questions that you might ask, what are you ultimately kind of looking for uh, in terms of characteristics? Um, and, and this is obviously through the lens of this person's going to make it, this person's not going to make it. Based on my pattern recognition, what are those characteristics that tell you if it's one versus the other? Yeah, I think, I mean, that one is really clear to me. The The individuals who come to the call, suspicious, sort of closed-minded with, I mean, they don't say, what do you want? But they're like, what, what do you what do you want to hear? You know, like, what, what can we talk about type of thing? Versus the individuals who come to the call and they're excited to talk to someone who has this experience of where they want to go and what they want to be. And they have some questions. Like it's not, it's not that they're formally showing up with these questions, but they do have some questions like, oh my gosh, tell me about this or tell me about that. Or I'm having this challenge. And it's just really a fun conversation and an open dialogue. And, and there's no sense of like holding back. I mean, transparency is key, a key tenet to any of these types of conversations or relationships. And people who show up that way and they show up curious with passion, those are the ones who always, I mean, you're going to do better in life. You're going to do better in your career. You're going to do better in anything if you show up that way versus kind of closed off and like, no, you can't really help me or no, I don't, I don't, this is not my thing. I got it under control. We're good. This is what we're doing. Nobody has it under control in a company that's growing revenue at, you know, 90% year over year. Like, that's impossible. You just don't. There's lots of things that you're not going to have the bandwidth to deal with. Yeah. So what I'm really hearing through that is is curiosity. Um, and, and what it looks like in real life is, does the person come to the meeting with the advisor that's here to help and view it as being called into the principal's office? <laughs> and so that's kind of more the, what do you want from me? Uh, what are we here for? Uh, this I was told I had to do this. So like, here I am, I'm doing it. Like, what next? Um, that could be a, a response that you get. And that doesn't show curiosity. The other side of the equation, what you were describing is somebody who's like, oh my God, thank you. There is an amazing expert that was gifted to me that I can go and get help from. Like, I got a list a uh, mile long of questions to ask you, Krista. Like, please help me. <laughs> like, one very much clearly shows curiosity and engagement and, like, I want to develop and I want to improve and I want to, you know, get to the next level. And one shows resistance and lack of curiosity. Yeah. And I think that there is a, a detail there that you might have somebody who shows up with that passion and curiosity, but their questions are relative to the size of the company are not what you would expect. And so in that scenario, I, I might go back and say, or the answers to my questions are still not at the level that I would expect for that size of company and where they're headed in the next three years. I would go back and in that scenario, I would say, hey, I, you know, and to, see, to be clear, CEOs are not always asking me to go and assess their team. They're like, hey, can you help this person out? You know, and then what naturally happens is, yeah, here's what I think. And then they're like, oh, well, I've been sort of, I have this feeling in my gut that maybe it is or isn't the right person. Like, what do you think? That's how the conversation evolves. So so those people who who have that curiosity and passion, 
but it's not like, you, you know, they might not be a fit for the role. I will go back to the CEO and say, hey, this person really showed up in an amazing way. I, I think that they can make it or I, I'm not quite sure, but I'm not convinced they can't. And so here's like how I would think about surrounding that person with support because I mean, the CEOs are almost always, it's it's pretty rare that I'm put into a situation of like, hey, I don't think this is the right person. Will you go check? Um, it's more of like, hey, go talk to my team. Tell me what you think, you know? Um, and so they come to it from a positive place in a positive point of view. And so if I can go back and say, hey, this person is, you know, showed up great, had great questions, but I'm not quite sure they're going to get there. So here's what I would do to make sure that you can continue to lean on this person who has been with you for so long and who has done all this with you like that's also a great outcome you know yeah yeah and in in addition to curiosity um another thing that strikes me here is how willing is somebody to change uh and how do they view change um and that that's people talk about that a lot you know are you comfortable to change or not but it's a different thing to sort of ask the very basic high level question and get a yes or no answer and be able to actually assess somebody on that and so w- what do you think about uh, is that an important part to you when you're doing some of these sessions is evaluating somebody's you know appetite towards and posture towards change or is that less important than curiosity yes 100% and how much time are they spending you know looking at there's a, there is an industry association for anything in this world, right? And there's, I mean, you don't even need that. You can Google it and find some cure, you know, inform- oh, I didn't realize that software companies were doing that. Or, oh, I, oh, let me and spend an hour and do it. I recognize that's hard to do as an operator because you're busy and particularly in startup mode. But um, I really encourage CEOs to encourage their people to do that and then individuals to do that as well because there's so much information out there. Um, but on the change thing in, in particular, again, curiosity and openness to change kind of go hand in hand. And you can usually tell if somebody shows up not curious and then something in the conversation becomes pretty clear that they do not want to change whatever it is they're doing in any way, shape or form, um, which should be a flag for CEOs like, wow, I'm in a high growth company and I have somebody who wants to keep doing something the same way. Like that doesn't work. Just fundamentally that is going to clash, you know? But when I was in an operator role, one of the questions I always asked in my interview was, <clears throat> in my interviews with people, uh, was, are you open to change? And everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm great for change, blah, 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 I love blah, blah. change. <laughs> right. I love change. It's great, you know? Um, and I And then I would say, well... I have yet to interview somebody who says that they don't love change or that they that they might not love it, but they can manage through it. And I would always say, before you really, truly think about taking this role, you need to have a long talk with yourself in the mirror and be really honest about how open you are to change. Because high growth companies are different companies every year. The company that you join one year is going to be, in many ways, a completely different company a year later. And being able to institute change and be a change agent, but also just to roll with change both inside and outside your purview, whatever the scope of your role is, is so incredibly important. Um, And I think what I do see sometimes is you have, and I can even say that like I, I was probably a little bit of this when I first joined Okta, where you have somebody who's, I came into Okta as a CCO and you, I had done the role, I'd done it all. I'd been at Salesforce for 14 years. I had this incredible experience. And you see some people who come in and it's really easy to just institute your playbook. And there were a couple of times where Todd, my, you know, my boss and the CEO of Octa was like, are you just doing your playbook or are you actually, and I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm not actually looking at what I'm just kind of doing my thing. And so it's also, you know, the onus is on us as leaders to really think like, okay, this is complete. Every time you go into a new role, this is different than my last one. It's a different company, different culture, different product, different customers, different everything. And your playbook will be different. Like you can take things from it, but don't do that. And how do you, because I I agree that this is a really hard thing to actually get the truth on because everybody will say what you said, um, which is, yeah, I love change. It's great. Um, So how do you, whether it's in an interview context, if you're bringing somebody new in, because that certainly applies here as well, or if you're, you know, assessing your team for, do I have the team for the future? Like, how do you get to the root of that? Like, how do you actually find truth there versus just people giving the right answer in an interview? 
Yeah. Um, I will ask, I mean, there, the first thing I do, as I say, listen, you just got to be honest with yourself. And I actually think that works because it, it underscores the gravity of what you're talking about. Like, uh, you need to be honest with yourself. Are you really good with change and are you good at it? And can you manage it? And can you create it? Because if you can't, you will not be successful here. And just being really direct and upfront with people about that, because some people will say, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm not like, I didn't really think about it, but maybe I'm not. It doesn't happen very often by nature of what they're interviewing for and they're interviewing for a startup. But um, the other things, the other questions that I will ask around this is tell me about a fundamental shift at your last company, whether it was a product pivot, it was, and these are go to market questions, but a product pivot, um, if it was a fundamental change in how you positioned your products, like how did you lead your team through that? Because, and I'll give you some context behind that. A lot of companies, these high growth startups, go from selling feature function to value. And this is also an area where CEOs can really look and, and ask their ask themselves the question, can my current leader take me to the next place? Feature function is, oh, we have this, 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 and yeah, our competitor has that, 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 and here's kind of the use case it solves for you. Selling the value is a very different conversation, right? Like here's what this is going to bring to your business from an efficiency perspective, from security perspective, and it's a different person that you're talking to. And so... And, and particularly for a go-to-market leader, you know, going from it's zero to 50 is often that feature function sell and sometimes even zero to 100. But then there's a shift where, and particularly if you're going up market into larger enterprises, where you have to start selling this differently. And so tell me about that process at company XYZ and what did you guys do and did you lead it and how did it go and what were the obstacles? Um, and you'll get a sense of, I mean, that's a very... A specific example of have they done this, but the way that they talk about it, you will get a sense of if it was a pleasant experience or not. And if it was not, that's an indicator of, oh, okay, so maybe this person won't be able to work through this type of change that we'll have because you'll have those changes many times. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. And another one that uh, that sort of jumped into my mind as you're describing that is Assuming that they're coming from, uh, you know, another startup or another uh, high growth company, it's like, hey, so it looks like you're at Company X for a handful of years. You joined and it was 100 employees. You're leaving now and it's 500 employees. Like, that's a lot of growth. Like, what was most challenging about that experience? Uh, and just open ended. And if like you start to hear things like, well, like, you know, like we never like I wanted to have a plan that was the same plan the whole time through. And uh, and then, you know, it was just constantly changing things. And, you know, um, the dog was chasing the tail and like all these things like obviously there could be some validity there if there's bad management. But if like what you were saying, it's how they answer the question. It's the energy you're you're seeing and your frustration that they're pointing to that will tell you what you need to know about, you know, are they comfortable with change or not? So yeah, go into those real life case studies and not just asking the explicit question, do you like change or not? But tell me about this experience. Tell me about this journey. Where was it most painful? Why was it most painful? How frequent was it painful? Um, that can really get you to the truth. Yeah. And I mean, the other big sign is because it got too big. And there are some companies, I mean, I was at Salesforce from 20 million to 3 billion, and we went from a couple hundred employees to 14,000 employees. For me, that was too big. That's different than a, than a, a than someone saying, oh, 500 employees or 250 employees was too big. Because if you're a 50 person shop, you're going to be at 250. If you're, you know, a high growth organization and, and you're having success, you you're going to be 250 or 500 pretty quickly and it'll happen in three or four years most likely. So that is the, it got too big um, or the politics of it because there's often in organizations like old guard, new guard, when it's time to sort of look at the leadership teams and shift and like, oh, these new people came in and blah, 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 blah. That's also a sign of, I mean, maybe the new people really were terrible. Chances are not all of them were, but that is also a sign of like, hmm, how are you going to do when this happens to us? Yeah. Yeah. You need to have your own curiosity as the interviewer to say like, oh, there was there was politics and that was challenging. Like, what do you mean by politics? Yeah, what did like, that ooh. look like day to day? And why was that frustrating to you? Um, yeah. And yeah, if they give a, you know, they were just terrible. They didn't know what they were doing. Then you're like, okay, fine. But if it really was just about change and I like the way that it was before and it's not like that anymore and like, I don't like changing, you know, that'll yeah. come through in the answers. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's key. Yep. 
Okay, so wrapping it up here, um, you know, a lot of folks listening right now are those founders and leaders at younger companies, um, you know, companies that might be in that sort of couple million of ARR up to maybe, you know, 20 million of ARR or something like that. And they, they primarily have been focusing on getting their team in place for the first time ever. Uh, and might not have asked themselves the question of, okay, great, I have them in seat, uh, but are they the right team for the future? And so if somebody's looking to you know, practice this uh, and embrace this kind of in real life today, but they've never done it before, what's a good starting point? <laughs> I'll say buckle up because you will be doing this for as long as you're CEO of this company. And just when you finish, you will start again. Um, which I think, you know, one of the companies I work with is um, a first time CEO and co-founder team. And we had I, I started with them and they were they already knew that they needed to to make some changes in their leadership team. And, you know, they made one and they made two. And he's like, OK, I'm done. And and I said, no, you're not like something's going to happen in the next month and you're going to see, oh, now I got to do this because it takes a long time to find the right leaders. I mean, you're talking about the top leaders in your organization, your directs, and those are not quick hires. You know, those are anywhere from three, three months at the very like best scenario to a year. And in some cases, a year and a half to really find the right individual. So if you take that across exec team of six and just do the math, when you, just when you think you're done, there's going to be the one that you started with who you might have to go back and look at again, you know, or sort of the next level down. So I think that is the first thing, like just get, make peace with it. Like this is part of your job. Uh, the same uh, CEO said to me the other day, he's like, I'm basically a glorified HR leader. Like that's all I do is people. I like, I don't get to do the product and the, you know, and I laughed and I said, there is some truth to that. Like, yeah, there are ways for you to extract yourself from much of this. And as you grow, you will. But really the key piece of it is the people piece. And it comes down to, like you said, the who. Yeah. And basically um, what you're saying there is that as founders, as CEOs, people need to be comfortable with change themselves because you're leading the organization that will never stop changing. And so your, your sort of uh, parting or your uh, advice of um, buckle up <laughs> because you're never going to stop doing this uh, is exactly right. And so, um, so everybody listening right now, buckle up, <laughs> take notes on this episode. Um, but, uh, but yeah, lean into it because um, as, as you know, I've heard many people say there's, there's kind of a direct correlation, uh, success in life in general, I think, but especially success as a leader, especially success in a, as a leader in a growing organization like a startup. There is a direct correlation between how successful you are and how willing you are to have uncomfortable conversations and do uncomfortable things. And so this is front and center in that. And so buckle up, lean into it um, because it ain't stopping. Yeah, and specifically lean into your instinct. Your instinct is usually right. And if there's something, like if you don't know where to start or you don't want to, listen to your gut. Um, there's something there, uh, you know, almost always. And it's, yeah, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Perfect place to leave it. Well, Krista, thank you so much for joining us on The Build Podcast. This has been fantastic and I'm sure incredibly helpful to everyone listening right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun.